So today's guest is Raymond Neutra. Raymond earned his bachelor's degree from Pomona College, his medical degree from McGill University, and both his master's and doctorate from the School of Public Health at Harvard. He then went on to make his career in medicine and environmental epidemiology. He taught at Harvard and UCLA prior to joining the California Department of Public Health to head up the Division of Environmental and Occupational Disease Control. Raymond is the son of perhaps the most well-known mid-century modern architect, Richard J. Neutra. I'm really looking forward to sharing the conversation with you guys, so let's jump right into it. So Raymond, I want to welcome you. Thank for thank you for taking the time to hop on with us today. I'm happy to be here. So I want to kind of just jump right into it. Um, I do want to start with a little story. In, in 2011, about 10 years ago, I listened to you and my professor, Barton Myers, from my UCLA graduate program on the roof deck of the VDL house, kind of talk about your father's legacy, his work, and your memories of the time you spent at the VDL house. I very strongly remember how captivated I was by the stories of it and also being in that environment on the roof deck, how powerful that particular place is. So let's kind of start off, and um, if you don't mind, I'd like to uh, ask you to kind of give the listeners a bit of a, a brief introduction on who your father was, um, his legacy, his career, and um, just kind of give us the penny tour, more or less, of your father. In, in preparing for this, I, I decided that I would pull together some uh, photographs. And so I'm going to share my screen and, and uh, uh, show you some things to illustrate what I'm going to be telling you. The textbook version of my father uh, is usually uh, limited to images of three residences that he designed during the course of his 40 year career. And uh, the first image would be of the so-called Lovell Health House in 1927, uh, which puts it right at the beginning of the, of the modern movement. And it was, uh, a very innovative structurally with, with a steel frame and, and, and sprayed concrete. And uh, it was called a health house because the client was uh, a naturopathic doctor. So there was a lot of attention to the kind of glass that allowed UV light to come in so that you wouldn't get rickets and would kill off the TB germs. The walls were washable. Um, very special kitchen for vegetarian food, a swimming pool suspended uh, on concrete uh, cradle and, and so forth. And then the next image would be of uh, Edgar Kaufman's winter retreat. Edgar Kaufman in the summer would retreat to falling water designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And, and this would the, the evolution of my father's work towards the look that would become mid-century modern with radical relationship to the outdoors and integrating um, uh, machine aesthetic with, with nature. And uh, another of a residence a year later in 1948, uh, reinforced concrete uh, um, um, and, and stonework related to nature and then there would be a, a mes, uh, mention that he was very interested in the brain and psychology and the impact of um, architecture and his book, Survival Through Design. So the bottom line is an architect of residential structures who uh, uh, was interested in integrating nature with uh, prefabrication and, and uh, industrial design with a big uh, uh, focus on psychology and the psychological impact of design. Um, and that's true as far as it goes, but um, we can talk more about what I think are, are his bigger impacts than just merely residential design. Well, perfect, Raymond. Thank you. Yeah, that's definitely the, I'd call it the, 
the Wikipedia version of, you know, what your father has done and, and kind of the legacy that he's left on the architectural community um, and the profession as a whole. Can you kind of walk us through his early career um, from working in Europe to moving to America, working with Wright in the Midwest, and then ev eventually transitioning and uh, planting roots out in California. I'm particularly interested in this uh, kind of small stint of time that he had in, in Taliesin with, with Wright. Uh, so my father was born in 1892, uh, which makes him among a few years younger than people like Gropius and Mies and, and Mendelssohn. Um, uh, and a little bit older than Alvar Aalto, the people that we hear most about as the early modern movement. Um, and so he grew up a turn of the century Vienna when it was still uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, he was Jewish, but not religious. Uh, and that made him part of uh, the intellect, many of the intellectual professions in, in, in Vienna, and yet there was a lot of anti-Semitism. So he was an outsider in a way. His family had moved in from Hungary uh, a generation before, like many people in Vienna. So there were Poles and Czechs and Hungarians and Slovaks and Slovenians and Croatians and, and of course, Germans. So it was a multicultural place he grew up in. And there was a ferment there with a small number of uh, um, critical thinkers like Sigmund Freud and um, uh, Arnold Schoenberg, the, um, the, the uh, composer, and Adolf Loos, the architect, who uh, were looking at the society that they were in, uh, seeing how fragile it was and thinking about what a new society could be. And um, he and uh, his slightly older school colleague, Rudolf Schindler, used to hang out with Adolf Loos at his cafe, hearing him hold forth. And one of the things that Loos held forth was about was his time in America, where uh, in the uh, early 1890s, uh, he was in America and he loved the United States. He loved the lack of pretension. He loved the fact that people that were cutting each other's throats in Europe were getting along together uh, in this new land and were willing to try out new things. And uh, uh, when they discovered Frank Lloyd Wright through the Rossmuth portfolio, both Schindler and Nitra were astonished by what they saw and that motivated both of them to go to the States. Schindler went in 1913. My father would have followed, but was drafted into World War I and spent four years hauling with horses, artillery pieces through the Balkans. When he got back from the war, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had collapsed. There was no work. When Switzerland uh, worked with a landscape uh, architect Gustav Amann there and got very interested in landscape architecture. And uh, then I got a, work, I got a job uh, in Vienna again with the Quakers, uh, interpreting for them uh, in Vienna, and then a, a job as a city architect in a suburb of Berlin, where he uh, did housing and in a um, forest cemetery. And Towards the end of that, he got a job with Eric Mendelssohn and worked with him for a few years. Uh, on, as his lead architect, he designed a number of uh, little houses in uh, uh, Vienna, uh, uh, in, in Berlin on his own, which uh, had uh, a feature of a room that was on a, like a merry-go-round, that there were two rooms on the same platform and you could roll it around and it would be a living room and roll it back again and it was another room. Um, and, and he, he and Mendelssohn run, uh, won a contest for a library in Haifa, Israel. And with that money, my father finally was able to go to the United States. Um, he worked in New York, then he worked in Chicago for uh, Hollabird and Roach, which was then designing the uh, Palmer House Hotel with many other 
um, functions in it. And uh, he uh, had a chance to meet Louis Sullivan on two occasions. And then even though he'd been corresponding with Wright for several years, trying to get a job, he finally met him face to face at the funeral of uh, Louis Sullivan and was invited to come and work at Taliesin, which he did for uh, six months. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then uh, Wright so I thought he was going to get a number of jobs, which fell through. And so my father moved on and uh, moved into the King's Row multifamily complex that Schindler had designed in Los Angeles. And they were in a loose partnership together with my father uh, uh, trying to do the um, commercial work while Schindler continued on his residential work. Although my dad helped Schindler with some landscape designs and some of his structures. Um, uh, towards the end of that period, uh, one of Schindler's clients um, uh, gave my father the assignment to do his Lovell Health House which Lovell kind of looked at it that he'd been working with a partnership and he wanted one of the partners to take the lead on it. My father was very reluctant to take this, to take this job and, and convince Schindler to participate and, and convince Lovell that it would be okay for Schindler to participate, but then Schindler dropped out and my father completed the work. Um, and after that, then there was the depression. And so my father went back to Europe to go to the second um, Congrès International de Architecture Moderne, Siam. And uh, uh, he lectured about several of the projects that he had done there and uh, taught at the Bauhaus for two weeks and was invited to Holland and met a lot of the Dutch modernists and in Le Corbusier and van der Velde and the other people. Uh, and then he came back and slowly started doing work through the thirties, which picked up and um, um, his financially, his career really took off after World War II um, and um, had a partnership with Robert Alexander doing schools and civic buildings and uh, international work. He, he died in 1970. I should say that in the late thirties, uh, he revived an interest that he'd had as a student in uh, physiological psychology and the impact of design and started writing essays in the 30s and 40s and finally published them as this book, Survival Through Design, um, in 1953. Right. And then of, of those influences that you kind of touched on in his early, um, let's call it early life and uh, pre before coming to America, you know, those people like Luce uh, and Mendelssohn and Wagner, um, and then even after coming to America with Wright, do you feel that, um, you know, of those, those influences on him, could you say that one had a stronger influence or impact on his later work um, more than others? Or you feel like there's one person in particular that really kind of, um, you know, you can see their design philosophies, their, you know, formal perspectives, their design process kind of, uh, come out in your father's work? Yeah, I think I need to show you some pictures again to illustrate uh, that. The influences were all rebelling against something, which uh, Wright uh, summarizes this. The buildings standing then were all tall and all tight. Chimneys were lean and taller still, sooty fingers threatening the sky. Dormers were elaborate devices, cunning little buildings, complete in themselves, stuck to the main roof. So uh, in the 1890s, then Wright and a number of other people were rebelling against this. Um, Otto Wagner uh, was doing it as my father was very young in, in Vienna. And Adolf Loos, who was a mentor of him, even wrote an article 
called Ornament and Crime and said that adorning buildings, which was basically what architecture was then, was a little bit like tattooing. And he said that people with tattoos were either in jail or were about to be jailed. Uh, so he wanted honest use of materials and celebration of materials. But very importantly, he was, he was interested uh, in architects as responsible craftsmen, not completely free artists who could do what they damn pleased. And he was very interested in the 3D use of 3D space. So this idea of an architect as a responsible person of not adorning uh, uh, efficient use of 3D space, uh, uh, my father took on board, but formally, uh, and this is an example of one of Losa's buildings where you see this beautiful marble and, and here in unadored, uh, the Miller House in Prague. Uh, but it was really Frank Lloyd Wright that uh, was uh, uh, the biggest influence. And I've written a, a Kindle book, uh, Cheap and Thin, uh, Neutra and Frank Lloyd Wright, because Wright uh, described the Lovell Health House that I showed you earlier as cheap and thin. And he meant it pejor pejoratively, but in fact, my father was very interested in being economical and he wanted to use prefabrication so it would be thin. Um, and he, he discovered right through this Vosmuth portfolio that came out in 1910, uh, published in Germany, not in the United States. Uh, and in it, Wright uh, talks about his eight points, which I think my father uh, exemplified in all his work, an open plan, a, a horizontal line and a relationship to nature, exploding the box, um, uh, no basement, the windows aren't little holes punched in the wall, but rather screens. Uh, the materials are, are the ornament and straight lines of the machine. The mechanical systems should be integrated into the design and linear built-in furniture. And as you'll see in subsequent pictures, all of that comes through, but much more stripped down than in, in Wright's work. So Raymond, I'm particularly interested in, in your father's time at Taliesin with Wright. And I know, you know, he only spent, I think it was five to six months there. And I know there was correspondence with he and your mother, um, you know, and other people about how enjoyable the time was there. But can, can you kind of give us some more insight into, you know, what his experience was like there? Um, the kind of, if there was any insight on the culture that Wright instilled in his, um, you know, in the people working in Taliesin. My father's life and Wright's life intersected at a point which was very low for Frank Lloyd Wright in the early, uh, early 1920s. Um, uh, Wright had uh, in 1910 um, um, left his first wife and children uh, with one of his clients and gone to Europe and worked on the Bosmouth portfolio. And they came back and some years later his, uh, a, a crazy butler murdered that new wife and, and her children and several other people and burned down Taliesin. So it was a scandalous kind of thing. And Wright was still recovering from that. Then he had married uh, Miriam Noble, and that was a very troubled marriage, um, which was dissolving around that time. There was hardly any work. And uh, for my father, uh, he had finally gotten to the United States, uh, was starting to work on a book about American construction and had a little money. Uh, he, he had left his uh, wife, my mother, uh, uh, with her parents because she was pregnant with my oldest brother. And um, my mother came ahead of uh, uh, leaving the baby who was about one year old by that time with her mother um, and came through Ellis Island, um, had to go to a court hearing to see whether she was a suitable um, um, uh, immigrant. And getting through that 
got on the train and went straight to Taliesin. So you can imagine a young couple who hadn't seen each other for a year uh, going from Ellis Island to Taliesin, just a mind blowing kind of uh, experience. And um, at that time, uh, Wright seemed to have a number of uh, uh, possible uh, jobs. One of them was a building in Death Valley uh, for a man named Johnson. And my father worked on that project. Ultimately, that fell through uh, in uh, Scotty's Castle, a, a, a Spanish revival uh, fantasy was built instead. Uh, but um, my father worked on that. And then Johnson had a skyscraper that he also wanted uh, right to design, which would have been very innovative and interesting, and that fell through. My father worked on that, and he also worked on the Freeman House. Um, um, there was a fellow named Fries, who is a publisher in Germany that my father knew, who was interested in publishing Wright's latest work, and my father, uh, always uh, a very creative public relations person suggested that rather than having an article, there be an entire book devoted to this. And, um, and so he um, uh, worked hard with Wright, who tended to be distracted uh, on, on putting that together. And in fact, a colored uh, reproduction book was published in Germany about the post-1910 uh, work of Frank Lloyd Wright, much of them projects which hadn't been built. Um, uh, but then all these projects with Johnson were falling through. This is a different Johnson than the Johnson Wax Johnson. Uh, and so uh, uh, Schindler invited my dad to come and join him in in Los Angeles. The the Chases had recently left, so there was a vacant uh, apartment there at Kings Road, and uh, Wright tried to convince him to stay, but but uh, they left on good terms, and um, um, my my parents came in and uh, settled with uh, Schindler, and. Uh, there are the relations continue to be very uh, cordial with Wright. My parents were invited to the marriage of Olga Ivana and Wright in La Jolla. In fact, my parents were there when Olga Ivana first appeared uh, at Taliesin, and my mother played the piano for Olga Ivana to dance in front of the fireplace. So it was a cordial relationship, and my uh, both my parents. Uh, were fond and admired Wright, um, uh, but my father was, um, despite adopting those eight uh, formal points, he was not an imitator of the Wright style. He, he used them in his own way. And when that uh, building was built, and particularly when there was an exhibition in 1932 uh, of the so-called international style that uh, Johnson and Hitchcock put on at the Museum of Modern Art, Wright was included as sort of a precursor to modernism, which angered Wright. And that's when he said Neutra's work was deep and thin. And uh, so there was a kind of suspicious uh, a relationship between of Wright towards my father on one occasion when he came to visit and uh, my parents put him on the train to go back to Chicago. As the train was pulling out, um, Wright said to my father, you know, Richard, they tell me you are my worst enemy. And my father said, well, you have to judge that for, <laughs> for yourself. I, I certainly don't feel that way. When I was about six, I think, uh, on the way back from Bennington, we stopped off at at, um, at Taliesin, and, and I have memories of, of that that trip. But the last letter was this um, um, friendly letter in the record, and then Wright returns the letter, uh, return, writes a return letter, and says, "Greetings to the clever Richard." Um, 
So there was always this, um, as, as was the case with Wright, I think uh, he, he needed to be acknowledged and for the people to work for him saying that really they had no ideas of their own, but um, were, were followers of Wright. But my parents continued their admiration for uh, uh, what uh, Wright had done and, and for his genius and um, um, and that wonderful start and inspiration of his passion for his work. Definitely. I think that that relationship with your father and Wright, you know, as time kind of plays out with the commission of the Kaufman Desert House, you know, I know that probably, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, brought some animosity from Wright towards your father for securing that commission since that Edgar Kaufman had you know, earlier commissioned Wright to do falling water, and he went with a different architect, your father, to do his desert house. Right. And I think that um, Wright even had a preliminary drawing for that site. And in, in, um, Edgar Kaufman Jr. was working with Wright and was really pushing for Wright to get the job. But for whatever reason, um, Edgar Kaufman wanted to go with my father and he was very much, uh, Kaufman was very much involved with the design of the house. Uh, there's a, um, a unusual feature of two sliding doors that come together in a corner uh, in that house. And it was um, um, Edgar Kaufman who, after the first design in the client notes, my father writes, um, um, Mr. Kaufman wants to have two sliding doors coming together at the corner without any frames at all. Um, and uh, that, that wasn't technically possible, but the frames were as thin as possible they could possibly be. So uh, um, Thaddeus Longstreth, who went on to a career of his own, and his son Richard Longstreth, who's a very distinguished architectural historian, uh, Thaddeus told uh, his son uh, in an interview uh, towards the end of his life that his job was to deal with the daily telephone call with Edgar Kaufman, who was on the site continuously making suggestions, most of which were not uh, really feasible, but it, that, that was Thad's job uh, to, to work on that. But Kaufman was very much involved with this project, which was characteristic of some of the best jobs that my father did. Uh, he uh, uh, enjoyed uh, uh, the constraints, if you like, that the clients uh, provided and the challenge for accommodating those. Uh, uh, Charles Eames said he never compromised Charles Eames said he never compromised, but he embraced constraints. That's an interesting segue to my next question. I know your father was heavily involved, um, or it's been said that he's been heavily kind of conscious of studying his clients prior to designing um, their structures that are or their homes for them. I know in a couple of essays I read that he had asked a particular client to record her daily activities. Um, and keep a journal of those activities so that he could, um, you know, kind of take inventory of those, find out which spaces are most important to her daily life, and then design the house um, around that data or that information. And that was kind of fascinating to me. Can you speak more about that? Yeah. So the, um, there, there are several of of the, uh, the, there's a movie about Windshield, the house he designed for, um, uh, John Nicholas Brown, which unfortunately was just uh, ultimately burned down, but um, where some of those details are, are laid out, there's also a book about it. That, and, and this was characteristic, particularly for projects where the design was done at a distance. And in one case, uh, the Brown House in Washington, D.C. actually spent a day with the young Mrs. Brown and their children seeing what was going on. Um, he, uh, he was fascinated on how architecture 
affords possibilities and accommodates what people do, how people socialize, uh, how their, their, what their psychological noticed and uh, experiences are, and also the unnoticed experiences. And he, he, he felt that um, um, that you experienced architecture with the eye, uh, also with the ear. You smelled things. You um, um, th there were many impacts, and then there were health impacts as well. And that, that all of those things suggested constraints uh, in in design. So he was very interested in uh, acquiring information about that. And typically, uh, when clients were able to come in person, uh, he and the architects in the office who are likely to be involved in the project uh, would be together and they would um, take careful notes uh, uh, about uh, things relevant to that. And then um, when my father was doing the preliminary designs, he would wake up at four in the morning and, and start uh, uh, designing, having absorbed all this, this stuff into uh, the preliminary uh, design. And uh, as people became more uh, experienced, he would entrust that task to uh, the senior architects, and then they would send up the designs to him, and he would look at them and tweak the designs. Um, um, and depending on the strong points of the different architects, different kinds of things would get tweaked. So, Raymond, where do you feel that that kind of um, design um, perspective or that approach to design came from in your father, his, you know, his, where he's considering almost the physiological experience of the building inhabitant more than, you know, the form of the building. Um, and he's considering the, uh, you know, the, he's almost viewing it in my, in my eyes as a cinematographer or a uh, movie director. And, uh, you know, looking at the sequence of how somebody experiences the building, where do you think that came from in him? Was it the, his exposure to, I know he was exposed to Freud um, at an early age, but uh, was that just a kind of a side interest or, or where can you trace that back to? You know, uh, um, one can see this interest um, from letters that he's writing to his uh, future wife in the early twenties. Uh, one of them, um, and, and it's, what he's des describing, what he's revealing is um, an enthusiasm for imagining scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's one letter where he is to entertain himself is designing a, an apartment uh, for somebody. And he invites my mother and her mother to participate in this uh, discussion through letters, and um, <clears throat> he, uh, um, my my grandmother is suggesting a particular placement of of a dining table, and then my father says, "Well, that's you know the, the upside of that is," and then he describes the convenience and the view, and he said, "But you have them on a bench and." Uh, when the younger daughter gets up to go and get dishes, then she's going to disrupt the, uh, I'll have to move by and everybody will have to get off the bench to, to do it. And, and But if you have it over here, and uh, it goes in another way, or and then there are other letters where he describes uh, experiences in, in, in um, uh, coming over the hill and suddenly seeing um, a tree that's on the other side of the hill starting to emerge as you arrive to the peak. And he, he describes what, you know, all the sensations of, of uh, muscular and smell and, and, and so forth. So um, there's a, um, 
inherent kind of a both aesthetic sensitivity, but also kind of an anthropologist interest in right. um, in people that that are somehow stimulating to him. So whereas some architects uh, uh, would be uh, see a form, a strong form, and then fit the functions into the form. Um, he seems to be starting with all these constraints which are stimulating to him uh, um, uh, about the resulting uh, formal resolution. And um, other than he's um, very committed to having this strong, ever stronger relation to the natural elements. I, I'm, I'm sitting ahead of a virtual um, image of the Reunion House, which is one of the buildings that the Neutra Institute is responsible for. Uh, and um, it, it's, it's a house without any really dramatic external view. It's a sort of a near garden kind of view, but the main decorative feature uh, is this garden view and the uh, little reflecting pool there. And the building um, is, uh, is sort of like the bass fiddle in a, in a, um, in a jazz quartet. It's, it's not the main melody. The main melody is uh, the garden. And uh, so being a landscape architect as well as an architect, he's really creating a whole environment. It's not just the, um, the building part. Yeah, definitely. That brings me to, it's a great segue to kind of um, another question that I have. I know your father was exposed to or worked in a nursery in, when he was younger and kind of had a lot of exposure to landscape. And it's obviously that in his designs, landscape is critical. Um, I know he had kind of um, some philosophies and perspectives on early human nature and uh, going back to, you know, the savanna, um, where our human origins kind of came from. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and kind of touch on the, his level of, um, let's call it interest in, in landscape and how you feel that that kind of impacted his legacy as an architect? I, I personally think that that's kind of one of the huge keys that um, made him or made his work so uh, strong. And I'm sure he also gathered some influence from Wright, but can you kind of touch on all of that? I think that he was very attracted by to Wright because of Wright's similar um, connection uh, to nature. He uh, he couldn't find any work as an architect, and so he just was really an assistant in this big nursery uh, where the landscape architect Gustav Amann was also working at the beginning of his career, and they formed a friendship. And my dad learned a lot about different kinds of plants and and uh, uh, how they, they um, um, their relative ages, what, what fit together and, 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 and so forth. And when he did that for a cemetery a few years later in Luckenwalde outside of Berlin, he specifies all the plants that had to be planted there and which ones would have to be replaced 50 years later. Uh, so he was anticipating the whole life cycle of how to maintain uh, uh, this for a cemetery, uh, which still exists uh, there and has uh, a few years ago was kind of uh, refurbished. Um, so uh, when he arrived in, in Los Angeles, um, he uh, did some landscape uh, um, work at Hollyhock House that Schindler was supervising and then with uh, Schindler's Beach House and the Level Health House has very elaborate uh, specification of all the different kinds of vegetation that would be around it as well. And the grounds were as important as the house itself. Um, uh, and there was a little waiting pool where the kids in the school would um, um, wade and uh, athletic equipment and courtyards and places where the kids could be doing some of their educational activities outside. 
So Raymond, in your eyes, what would you say is the most successful project that your father carried out? And I know success can be defined in many different ways, but is there a project um, in particular that kind of stands out in your mind? Yes, let me tell you the one that I that to me poses the questions that are still relevant today that um, that is most interesting because you know that houses like the Kaufman House it's a typology that is a phenomenon of a particular era when the richest country in the richest state in the world for a period of about 30 40 years uh, people were able to afford these standalone houses. Now, of course, they still are going on and Dwell Magazine pays attention to those particularly, but most people do not live in those kinds of places. And the Neutra VDL studio and residence, residences is not really a house. And it, it has many lessons for us. It has lessons about the efficient, particularly at this time in the United States where we have all these homeless people uh, and in a, in a time when people are old like me and people are concerned about, you know, where are we gonna end our days? And, and so the VDL has many interesting, uh, grappled with questions and they had particular solutions that are thought provoking. And so, um, the, um, it's called VDL because of, a, of the man who lent the money to my father to build it. Case van der Leo was a theosophist, which was a spiritual movement. Um, uh, it was worldwide and he was in Holland and was interested in particularly in, in compassionate uh, management labor relations. And uh, he was also a, a, um, a proponent of modern architecture and he uh, designed this uh, factory of, of his family business where coffee and tobacco was packaged. And uh, he invited my father to Holland in 1930 and 31 came to Los Angeles and uh, had my father show him what was going on in Los Angeles and at the end of the day, asked him where his house was. My father said he didn't have the money to build his own house. He lived in a rented bungalow and, and um, van der Leo pulled a checkbook out of his pocket and said, how much do you need? And my father stammered out a number, I think it was $8,000. <coughs> no, it was $3,000 that he got. The median house cost 8,000 in that day. And uh, so he built uh, and he called it the VDL house because van der Leyen didn't want his name to be used. And when he was in Holland, my father saw this kind of Dutch architecture, which you can see the relationship to Frank Lloyd Wright. And it inspired him to continue in this way. And uh, he ended up building the Neutra VDL studio and residences uh, it built in three phases, 32, 39, and then in 66. And I'll explain why. It's now a National Historic Landmark. And this is what it looked like, uh, the first phase in 1932, with a, uh, a roof deck up here, balconies on the second story. It's two stories because the view is across the street to Silver Lake. Um, and this is what you would see from that roof deck. Uh, a roof deck, by the way, it was a wonderful idea, but in fact, it was so impacted by the sun that it was rarely used, except for me, who used to throw dirt clods down on the cars as they went by. Uh, and later, you know, when it, the house was rebuilt, uh, that lesson was learned, and there was an enclosed space that you experienced that time with your professor. Uh, so it was built as an experiment, and there were 15-page coverage of this little place, which was uh, about 1,500 square feet. Um, and uh, experimental in structure in that the module was based on standard uh, steel frames that, uh, that would fit and be raveted into the um, uh, wood structure. Uh, there, there was um, stucco on one side and uh, plywood paneling on the other. Uh, um, 
there were awnings that came down to control the sun. One side had silvered uh, insulation on the south and uh, there were prefabricated um, trusses that uh, uh, formed the foundation. Uh, and there was a lot, for the first time in my dad's work, and I think in anyone's really, there was an integration of nighttime illumination into the very structure of the building following Wright's idea of mechanical systems uh, would be part of the design. Um, and you see um, how important that light on the outside was in allowing you inside to see what was going on instead of the reflection of the room. And then it was innovative in the way that it used space, building out to the side. It was a 60 by 70 foot lot. And this is how the neighbor used it. And uh, the VDL extends to the thing. And it was not a house, but separate houses, uh, each developed to be more or less complete within itself. Um, and so uh, theoretically, a couple could live in, in these two bedrooms. A bachelor could live here. They could share a kitchen. Uh, the people on top could get out this door. The people here could go down and get out that way. On the bottom floor, there was another bedroom and a bathroom. So two couples could live there in a, in a place for a couple here with a kitchen and a bathroom that these two couples could share. Uh, and during the day, a few draftsmen here could share it. Now, you can imagine nowadays couples who are working uh, remotely uh, and, and sharing uh, a house, but the traffic pattern is such that these people have separate ways of getting out. This, this whole complex, um, uh, and this is the drafting room. Um, so, the couples are here and using this kitchen and this guy is sleeping in a place that has a curtain uh, and they have access to this second story balcony, which as the trees grew up came to look like this. Um, a little dining nook, this thing folds up and there's a, a sink underneath there to mop the floors. Um, Here's my grandchildren looking at how it looked in 1939. This, this unit was built and my parents uh, slept in this living room. I had a little room here and a playroom there. On the top floor, Frank Wilkinson and his wife and little kid lived as a renter. Uh, he went on to start public housing in LA. Uh, the office was down here, and the spinster lady lived in a little apartment there. Households in an office, all existing on a 60 by 70 foot lot. And this is the Nitra family as it looked uh, in the late 40s. Um, and uh, this is that lower ADU unit, you might say. Right. This structure folded up and it was bedding that would roll out and my parents would sleep in, in, in there in that space. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Um, looking out at this little patio. So that this is a tiny little patio, but it, it, it creates nature in an intimate uh, little space in the 60 by 70 foot lot. Here's Frank and his wife. In 1963, the front unit burned uh, and my brother and uh, my father together uh, redesigned, but on the same footprint and the same foundation. Uh, now this rooftop garden has that structure on the top. There was a reflection pool on the roof. Every level of the house has a little water feature where the ripples in uh, the light are reflecting up on the ceiling. Um, the living room was like that. Um, uh, features for relating the kitchen to the living area. Um, the little bedrooms are sort of like uh, staterooms and a steamship, everything completely thought through so that there's no wasted space. And looking out at this little pool on the second floor, uh, once again, the water roof with reflections in a little uh, elevator so that my mother in her later years could get up to that top level. Uh, 
My mother ended her days in that living room that I showed you, uh, being taken care of by a cook and a daytime nurse. And a few months before her death, uh, this architectural historian, Alexander Stonis and his wife, Leanne Lefebvre, came for a visit. So this elderly person was able to age in place despite the fact that she had just recently had her leg amputated. You know, what's really interesting to me about VDL, um, the VDL house is the concept, and you touched on it briefly about, you know, more or less of an ADU design where it's live work. There's a separate detached structure. Um, you know, with the recent legislation that's come into place, it was 2019 in California, allowing the ADU and allowing the JADU on the properties, I think is really kind of um, about to change or is changing the pattern of development um, in, in um, you know, in the area. Most of the clients that come to us, if they're even if they're requesting a large custom home, are often requesting uh, that they take advantage of the ADU law and that they place an ADU on the property, implement a JADU on the property. And I think, um, to your point, it often creates a very kind of creative uh, housing solution. Obviously, it, it generates more housing, but it's also, um, you know, in my mind, it creates a more interesting and unique architecture too. Um, we're forced to kind of design the site plan for different areas of privacy. Like you were mentioning, one uh, family living in the ADU can exit or enter the home in one way, completely private, and then one, the other family can enter or exit the, the structure in one way, also completely private. There may be small areas of communal activity, whether that's in an exterior courtyard or some space in the building but, um, you know, I'm really, I, I'm glad that you kind of brought the VDL house up. And I think it's an important thing for not only, um, you know, homeowners um, to understand, but also younger architects to kind of understand that there are more creative housing solutions beyond the single family home that can help sor solve larger uh, societal issues, but then also produce interesting architectural uh, results and I, uh, I don't. I think those are not. Um, it's not limiting. In other words, I think that it's a, it's a uh, benefit in both. Um, you know, a, it can be a, a benefit in bo both aesthetically and both for uh, society. Absolutely, and it also um, the VDL pays a lot of attention to traffic within the structure, so that things can go on simultaneously uh, without interfering with each other. And it, um, this played out in my youth because I was a little kid growing up in a place where there were anywhere from three to nine draftsmen working uh, in that uh, drafting space that in the evening there were clients in, in my living room and um, I could, I could be a kid in this thing without bothering other people because of the way the traffic and the exits. This, this whole complex has 12 exits to the outside. Um, so um, there's a lot of thought to that. Then there's a lot of thought to the uh, life cycle of the people who are in there. So my mother came in there as in her late 20s and, and died there at age 89 and um, at that time that she was being taken care of by the nurse, there was a Cal Poly professor and his girlfriend who were living in that lower unit and renting it and, and generating some income. And, um, um, and as I say, there was, an, there was another, there, it was possible uh, for Frank Wilkinson and his wife to live in those two bedrooms and have the kitchen and have the living room during the day while my father used it as a client uh, um, interview space at night after dinner. And, and so there's a lot of attention there to make, uh, if you did a time-lapse photography of who was where in this space, it's extremely complex. And when I'm there and people, when taking people around, people say, well, where was your room? Well, my room was at least four different locations depending on 
who uh, who else was living in the house at, at, at that time. So um, the imagination, if you think of a time-lapse photography over 50 years is what the architect is trying to anticipate and, and accommodate. Right, and you know that kind of makes me think about the, the you recently sent me that article about um, you know your father and, and Luce and how you felt that uh, Luce kind of instilled the um, let's call it or provoked the idea in your father to question societal norms and to kind of question uh, regularities that are just kind of implemented because of tradition. I think that, you know, this is a perfect example of how your father carried that philosophy out in his work, which is fascinating to me. Yeah. That whole group, uh, that minority group in turn of the century Vienna, who were starting to criticize and think, you know, how else could we live? Um, just, carried through that you can imagine doing something quite different and that uh, th that was something that uh, that he valued and um, um, was inspired by. I think Wright had, was full of imagination also about alternative ways of, of how we could do things. So Raymond, as we kind of wind down, what do you feel is your your father's most uh, significant impact um, and lasting impact on the practice of architecture? I think there's several of them uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, what things were influenced in a, in a positive way by what he did. And I have some pictures to maybe illustrate some of this. So while the textbook emphasized the residences, uh, my father always was interested in what he called architecture of social concern. And I think he had a big influence on the way people design schools. And um, this started uh, with a pro with a theoretical project in 1926 of a prefabricated ring plan school, which would have a indoor outdoor uh, uh, pattern of space with a, in this case, a door that folded up to allow all kinds of instructional activities of do by learning kind of things, uh, bilateral illumination um, and uh, clear story illumination. Um, and it turns out that the Lovell Health House itself was a school and house in one. This is 93 year old Hap Lovell, the last surviving uh, student of that school. Leah Lovell was a trained educator from uh, a student of John Dewey and believed by learn by doing. And there are all kinds of uh, um, uh, home movies of the little kids weaving and basket weaving and um, uh, doing athletic things around the gardens that my father designed. Uh, in 1936, 10 years after he first started thinking about this, he was finally able to do a demonstration school, the Corona Avenue School uh, with sliding doors and gardens. And uh, in a few years later on the island of Puerto Rico, he designed standardized um, uh, schools uh, that, that are still there and uh, that were published in a Brazilian a book that was published all over South America uh, with images like this of uh, reinforced concrete uh, structures. Uh, and in Mexico, the architect Artigas was influenced by that. And you can see these standardized schools all over rural Mexico. And uh, this is the UCLA laboratory school with indoor outdoor instruction. Uh, and my father designed eight of these schools, but this became a, a pattern of school design that was different than the little brick schoolhouse all over the world really. Uh, and then he had a tremendous impact as a propagandist and networker. He, he really knew everybody who was anybody in the architectural field. And starting with this book that he wrote in 1927, How America Builds, uh, describing this for Japan and South America and Europe, 
the American way of building. Uh, and then 12 books that he wrote. Uh, but he also traveled and lectured everywhere. In 1946, he was sent by the State Department to South America. And he came upon this building by the architect Hardoy in uh, Buenos Aires with these wooden uh, sun louvers. And he wrote article about it and then incorporated it both for wind and sun uh, at the Kaufman Desert House and with his Los Angeles Hall of Records. So a movable way of adjusting sun control. You know, he also used these uh, um, integrated into the design of the building rather than tacked on these crank up uh, um, awnings to control sun from the day. And then he was very interested in low cost housing and prefabrication and apartments. Uh, he wanted to focus on the clientele that used to live in these slums. Uh, here is a steel and uh, plywood uh, demonstration house from the early mid thirties. Uh, a whole community outside of Dallas, Texas of prefabricated uh, houses with separation of vehicular and, 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 and pedestrian traffic. Um, as was also the case of housing for dock workers in San Pedro with uh, furniture that he designed that, that they could build themselves. Uh, but this really didn't take in the United States. The only people who get prefabricated houses are the rural poor. Uh, but my dad continued with military housing and in, Euro in Europe designed two Eichler-like communities for lower middle class people with houses like this. And then the apartment started in 1926 with this reinforced concrete uh, um, balcony apartments in Hollywood. Um, these apartments in Westwood, that's now a co-op uh, uh, student housing. The Strathmore apartments of 1937 uh, with balconies. Uh, Kelton apartments 42 with large outside um, um, balconies. So even in, in, in apartment living, you can have this kind of closeness to nature. I think the other impact was that a number of the alumni of his office went on to head uh, architectural schools, Harwell Harris, Gregory Ayn, Joseph Allen Stein, he recommended for a job in Calcutta who had a big career in, in, in India. Eric Schneider Vestling went back to Munich and was professor and then, of course, my brother Dion, who, who continued the practice with this uh, beautiful uh, library in Huntington Beach and uh, this house for the cartoonist uh, Lou Scheimer. Um, so we've talked about the influences, but I think th those are the, uh, the impacts that go, uh, go beyond the purely formal thing that shows up in the art histories that deal with architecture. So Raymond, if people want to get in contact with you or reach out to the Institute, can you let them know where they can find you at? In 1961, my father started a nonprofit, the Nitro Institute for Survival Through Design, uh, which has this website, uh, www.nitra.org, where you can get uh, my contact, contact information. The vision about what we want to see is surviving and thriving in the climate crisis through well-researched designs that serve humanity and the planet. And uh, the mission one, which was the original mission, was fostering those who research and design responsibly. Um, there's plenty of support for beautiful architecture, but not as much attention to researching about what works and why and, and about the people who are doing designs other than luxurious uh, houses or iconic public buildings, a whole typology of, of uh, hospitals, clinics, schools, libraries, um, public uh, park spaces and so forth. So we, we want to foster those who are figuring out what works in that domain and, and, and celebrating them. Uh, and then the second mission is advancing stewardship and supporting uh, the interpretation of the Neutra legacy. Uh, because 
Uh, my brother Dion has left us uh, three Neutra design structures in the Silver Lake District, all of them that have uh, ADUs or apartments in them. And we want to relate to the VDL, which is down the street, which is owned by Cal Poly Pomona, with whom we cooperate. And then it's within the so-called Neutra colony of, of 11 Neutra designed buildings here. Uh, but there's also 15 different archives around the world that scholars use. And we want to be supportive to the Neutra clients that are trying to restore their properties uh, by uh, featuring successful uh, examples. And those will be helpful to anybody who has a mid-century uh, building that they want to restore. So um, those are our missions. And and the legacy is really not just of my father, but also of my mother, who was as much a partner to him as Elaine Saarinen was to um, Eliel Saarinen or, or Ray Eames was with, with Charles Eames. Um, and, and she was the one that kept the whole network around the world with, with people and, and a number of interesting and active women in, in, uh, in their respective careers. And then, of course, my brother Dion that's sitting there. I'm the little kid there sitting next to my dad, and that's my Aunt Regula, who for eight years lived with us and was part of the household of my father's office director. So uh, it's, it's an interesting legacy that, uh, that we want to be uh, helpful with. Perfect. Well, Raymond, again, thank you. It was a pleasure speaking with you, and I really appreciate you making the time to, to have a chat. I'm delighted that you're interested in our story. Thanks so much, Mitchell. So thanks for listening to the discussion today. If you'd like to learn more or if you'd like to contact us, please reach out to us at rostarchitects.com.